With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. So you might have heard tell there's a lot of folks that have the economy on their mind, specifically the consumer economy. Coming out of the pandemic and as life tries to get back to normal while people kind of keep one eye still on the coronavirus pandemic to see if it's going to come back or get worse, we're starting to kind of figure out what kind of an economy we're going to have. That means we're having a lot of discussion on what happened during the pandemic, what's happened after, and what should we do about it. Now, we know a lot of these things are regulated by the government, how businesses run, how things are done. And we learned very rapidly during the pandemic that there's a lot of regulations that just got swept to the side for immediate reason, which brought up the point, well, what kind of regulations do we need and don't we need? The consumer economy is a great place to discuss things because sometimes we get wrapped up in big ideological ideas or deep policy initiatives and we kind of forget that normal everyday people need something to actually be able to understand. And the consumer economy is a great way to discuss that because that's where policy and ideologies and things like this that are big words and big concepts become very real because some folks may not understand a big breakdown of how the economy works, but they understand when prices change or when they have extra fees or pay extra taxes or when, like during the pandemic, the government comes in and says, you can't shop in these particular places, you can't go to these particular places, you can't travel, you can't do this, you have... So we're going to turn to our friend Yala Lasowski today. He's from the... He's the Deputy Director of the Consumer Choice Center and he deals with these sorts of issues in a very practical way. How policy meets the rubber of the road of individual people almost every day. We're going to talk about a lot of these things like travel, for example, how government regulation affects that. This is the summer where a lot of people are trying to get out and out and about over the pandemic. He also has a piece out in RealClearMarkets.com about the Biden executive order that just came out. Now, this executive order was under the heading of competition, trying to foster better competition in the economy among businesses. But it is an executive order, which means more regulation. There were 70 items in that executive order. We're going to talk about all those with him. We're also going to talk about kind of a bigger picture thing of how consumer choice is a great model for freedom. How we deal with things like how the government regulates us, how we make laws, how we make rules, how we self-govern, and how we push back against government that sometimes encroaches too far. These things all meet and all those streams cross when we start talking about the consumer economy, and he's a great advocate for consumer choice being a good instrument for positive change in the world. So today we're going to talk to our friend Yale Elisovsky from the Consumer Choice Center. We're going to talk consumer choice. What does that mean to us? We'll talk the Biden executive orders, and we'll talk a little bit about about more how we use freedom with voting by our feet and voting with our pocketbook. All that today on Herd Tell, right after this. And I'm going to really enjoy this with my friend Yael Asoski from the Consumer's Choice Center. He's written all over the world. Uh, we're thrilled to have him live from Vienna, Austria. Yael, my friend, how are you, sir? Well, I'm doing much better now that I get to talk with you here on Herd Tell. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you. Uh, Yael, tell me about uh, the Consumer Choice Center, because I really like how it's, we talk culture and politics and big ideas and specific policy, and we can kind of get a little pedantic with some of that stuff or real niche with it. But what you're doing is when you talk consumer choice, that's where policy and politics and people's everyday life and what they do, that kind of all meets together in consumer choice, and that's the angle you bring to that. Uh, Explain to folks what that is, because I really find it to be a useful tool to talk about really big ideas in a practical way that people can use almost every day in a lot of ways. So the the kind of phrase, consumer choice, it's more of an idea that comes from economics, the idea of how many options do particular consumers have in the market. So we've kind of taken that to the next level. And I think every single person... They work their nine to five job, they finish up, they go home, they just want to have, you know, a cold drink, sit down at the end of the day. They don't think about the rules and regulations that go into all of the things that they're going to enjoy or not enjoy on the weekend. If they're thinking about alcohol taxation, if they're thinking about regulations on sharing economy things like Uber and Airbnb, these are all things that are passed and done in the name of consumers but oftentimes actually do not advance their interests. And that's where 
the kind of group of guys and girls that I work with. When we founded this idea back in 2017, we saw that there are so many great innovative technologies out there. There are things like Uber, there are things like Airbnb, there's all these online services that deliver things to your door. There's all these great new companies that are actually addressing concerns that people have in the market and doing much better than traditional NGOs or government agencies. And most people don't think about that, I think. No, well, the old adage used to be people vote with their wallets and vote with their feet. And it seems to me like there's a lot in our political realm and the ideological realm where people have kind of noticed that, but instead of dealing with, okay, how do we foster people to vote with their feet and vote with their wallet, they've decided instead of going to the people and trying to convince them that they're going to use things like regulation and government power to funnel and direct people to do what they want them to do, and that's the conflict in all this. Yeah, and it's about letting the people decide. And, you know, a complaint that was often launched by Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is that, you know, you don't need 25 different types of deodorant. You know, that's a that's a big thing that a lot of people use, that you don't need all these different companies. But all these companies exist, and they're able to make profits, and they're able to deliver things that people want. So why not? That competition actually serves to provide you with better products at better prices. And that's something that the average consumer group does not take into account. The average consumer group, which kind of grew out of the Ralph Nader-esque, you know, 1960s and 70s consumer safety movements, are usually inter interested in restricting products or banning them, uh, putting some type of law on the books that make it harder to do X or Y. And we saw it as the opposite. It's, well, what are the smart rules that we can actually introduce or discuss that would make things easier, you know, that would allow us to access these products that didn't exist before? or that now there are new models for. Everything that millennials particularly enjoy on the internet, you know, really since we've been in high school and going above there, these are things that are, have didn't exist before. You know, things like the sharing economy, things like cryptocurrencies. Um, in different states, you now have legalized cannabis that you can buy at the store. I mean, these are things that have existed on black markets forever, and now we have market options. And it's that kind of angle that we try to take, uh, writing articles, across the world, trying to talk to politicians, introducing bills, uh, working with different social media platforms to get that word out. It's, it's a yeoman's job, but it's a lot of fun. And when I sit down at the end of the day, I know that I've done something good because I'm trying to improve the quality of the goods and services that we get and not always just trying to pass a, a ban or a restriction. And it's a lot of stuff that is not necessarily ideological. You know, we're all ideological. We all have one baked within us that we've learned, that we've gleaned from family and friends or from our schooling. But really how people are impacted by various rules and regulations, it's not always calculated. And not everybody can take economics courses. Not everybody understands political science. But if we just boil it down to how are you as a consumer, as someone with a wallet and feet, how are you impacted? And how is a particular rule or regulation actually hampering your choice. We just think it's a, it's a much more effective way to look at it. So the impossible question, but I will ask it to you anyway, because this is your kind of bailiwick and area of expertise. Ever since we've had more than one human who decided that they wanted something the other human wanted, we've had to need some kind of regulation. So to you, what's the standard? Where do we look at something and go, here's, here's where we balance freedom against a need for some regulation. You know, uh, humans do need to be governed to a level. We want safe products. We want quality products in the marketplace. For you, though, as, as a consumer advocate angle, where do you draw that line between freedom and needing some regulation and then when things can get into oppression or manipulation by a government entity? Yeah, and, and, and you know, I'll be very clear. There's uh, manipulation and lying that happens both in the corporate world and in the government world. And it's kind oh, yeah. of a, it's a, it's a universal feature of everything that we face. I think what the better way to approach it is, we just need smarter rules and regulations that make sense in the 21st century. Um, examples that I always use are things like the three-tier system of alcohol uh, that we have in states like North Carolina and some other southern states. Uh, if we look at still cannabis prohibition, and you know they might be talking about it in D.C. for years and years, but there are many states where it is legal. And you know what? People can go and can read the ingredients, they can read the processes, they can compare the companies, and that's much better than the illicit market on the streets where you don't have that kind of thing. So I don't think there's a 
even base of how regulation should be. It just should be smart. You know, allow the innovators to innovate, allow consumers to access those goods. If there are harms that come from those, we have a justice system that's meant just for that. We have regulations on particular products you're not allowed to put in certain things. And I think that's stuff that most people would agree with. That's not necessarily what we need to be ripping down from the fences. However, we do need to have a smart base, you know, allow people to innovate, allow the market to deliver in many circumstances. When if we look at things like alternative energy, uh, for instance, I think that's a good example. Climate change is on a lot of people's minds. There's so much focus on just how do we get this amount of government money into these people's pockets or hands when the question that should be we should be asking is, all right, how can we create the innovation that will allow us to solve these problems? And I think that's that's all too often lost in the conversation. Yeah, I think so too. Let's let's use a real world example folks can relate to. It's summertime here in the United States of America where I'm recording this. Uh, it's post pandemic, so we are seeing record setting travel from folks. Take something like traveling, because you've just done this. You've made an overseas trip from uh, Europe to America recently. Things like airlines, things like car rentals, the eternal debate over mass transit and the train system in America versus what they have in Europe. Something like travel, which affects almost all people in some way, shape, or form. A lot of folks don't realize how much regulation dictates how they travel, where they travel, how they pay for that travel, where they go. Let's use that as a real-world example to talk about some of this stuff. So Pete Buttigieg is our Secretary of Transportation. Yes, he is. And he actually does have a lot of of power. (laughs) Big fan of trains and uh, cycling and all the rest. And he does have a lot of power. And when you actually start thinking about it and you start investigating it, let's take the U.S. Airlines uh, as an example. You go to the Charlotte Douglas Airport in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, getting ready to go on a trip. You look at your airlines. You have your you know, whatever, American Airlines, you have your Deltas, you have your Uniteds, um, you have some foreign airlines that are flying off to international destinations uh, where they'll allow you to come in. When we look at that alone, we notice that there are no international airlines that can fly between different domestic ports in the United States. Now, some of this is just because the the market and obviously American Airlines has a lot of power. But then we actually look into the laws, we look into things like the Jones Act, Merchant Marine Act, um, back in 1925, we look at cabotage laws. These are regulations that restrict the nationality of companies that offer transportation services, particularly those that do shipping and also those that are uh, airlines. And what's so problematic about this is that we have foreign companies that offer us goods and services every single day. Spotify is a Swedish firm. You know, we listen to podcasts or music on there, uh, all types of foreign products that we eat and drink, um, cars that we drive. But for some reason, the transportation that's offered can only be U.S. companies that offer these transportation services between domestic ports uh, and capitals. I think that's a big one. If we were to imagine a system like in Australia where you can have foreign airlines that do shepherd people between Perth and Sydney and Melbourne and all these other cities— you would actually have much cheaper flights. I mean, the the state of the airline industry in the U.S. when compared to Europe, where I can hop on a Ryanair flight for 50 euros or Wizz Air for 35 to go to Greece or Ireland or anything else, that is because there are all these different competitors. And unfortunately, we prop up too many of our airlines. We bail them out at every single chance that we get. Uh, They got something like $50 billion in the CARES Act. There's all this stuff that happens on on the front end, and some of it has been in place for over a hundred years. So that's a big one. The other one, pet peeve of mine. Thank you for mentioning it. Rental cars, <laughs> rental cars have basically been the same for the last thirty or forty years. It's the same number of companies. They actually have been lobbying um, at airports, at state legislatures, to ensure that they are the only ones who are able to provide any type of rental services at airports specifically. Meaning. There are many upstarts that offer peer-to-peer car sharing where uh, Andy has his Honda Accord and wants to rent it out for the next two weeks because he's staying at home and doesn't need it. Uh, He lends it out for $50 a day, makes a profit. The customer's happy. It's great. It's consumer choice. Unfortunately, many airports, because of the rules and regulations passed by state legislatures, are not allowed to offer those services at airports. So rental car industry, the, the one that have the monopoly, 
they basically are the only choice. That means that you have less choice. It means that new market entrants, new innovators can't offer their goods and services. Uh, I think those are two smaller examples that speak to the big ones. And then we don't even need to talk about the large elephant in the room that is Amtrak, uh, which does not have much competition as a domestic passenger railway company. I appreciate the bougie bump up to the Accord because I only have a Civic. But uh, yeah, let's 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 talk trains because I, I keep running into this online and my background is actually in transportation. I love trains. I lived in Europe twice. When I lived in Europe the first time, I was in Frankfurt, which you you know this. Frankfurt is one of the great rail connecting cities and airport connecting cities in all of Europe. I had my EU rail pass. I was under 26 at the time, and I forget. I think it's like 150 euros a month, and you could go anywhere in Europe except for parts of the Eastern Bloc on your e rail pass, and I wore that thing out. I loved it. But if we're going to talk consumer choice in America, Amtrak is... How do I explain this the best for folks? You know, Amtrak services 30 million people. The domestic airlines in America service a billion people. It's not a it's not a fair comparison business-wise, economics-wise, or consumer choice-wise to try to think that we're going to make Amtrak into an airline competitor, is it? No, not at all. And the main roadblocks there are federal regulations and um, rules. And if we look at Amtrak, it's a quasi- public corporation. Um, so it's this kind of, you know, strange 50 year old beast that really has no competition because all the rules favor it. It's not classified technically as a monopoly, though in practice it is. They own all the railway lines. Uh, they're the ones that are able to build all the stations and they don't really need to have any additional approvals from local governments. And that's an advantage that they have not to mention the total just calamity of the amount of subsidies. They're about to, to get $80 billion in the next transportation bill. And this is essentially the monopoly in passenger rail. Freight rail, uh, still very competitive. There's a lot of great Canadian companies as well that uh, do rule the day throughout the U.S. But there aren't any competitors. There are a few that are trying uh, Virgin Trains and Brightline down in Florida. They built a line between West Palm Beach and Miami. Uh, but they had to build it on their own. You know, they weren't able to rent out any lines. They weren't able to get subsidies. And it's very difficult to have any kind of competition to that. And it's just a program that's continued on and on. And if we look at Amtrak, whatever money they're making and however many passengers they have, it's only in one section of the country. It's the Northeast Corridor, uh, D.C. up to New York, New York. Uh, Massachusetts, all these areas. That's the only place that really makes any money, and it's where all the passengers are. If you could imagine competition on those lines like we used to have, you could have you know much better services available. Maybe you'd have electric trains. Maybe you'd have trains you know powered by biofuels or hydrogen cells or something. I, what we have now is just this age-old monopoly that we continue feeding money into. We don't allow competition. And it just means that railway travel will never be like it is in a place like Europe. It's not a question of density or space. It's all a question of what the rules and regulations are. And the thing with the rail stuff, um, with Amtrak especially, is it, it has a market. The Northeast Corridor, like you said, something like 80% of Amtrak passengers are in the top 10 uh, metro areas. You're never going to have what Europe calls intercity rail or regional rail, we would call it here, because you don't have the feeder system locally to feed a regional rail system on a technical level. And it seems like they want to try to make a utopian ideal of transportation. You know, I come from a transportation background. I can look at that silly map people keep twist tweeting around and I'm be like, yeah, that's never going to work because I understand how eminent domain works. The reason they can't take over freight lines is number one, you can't run high speed rail on them anyway. And number two is uh, you're going to lose, you're going to tank the economy because you can't take the ra the pass the rail off for passengers because passengers don't make money. Freight rail makes money. But on the practical level that you're talking about is folks at some point just look uh, at those things and go, why are we spending money to expand something that isn't working in the one area of the country that it should already be working in? Because Amtrak should be profitable because it does have basically a monopoly on the Northeast Corridor. Yeah, indeed. And I, the argument that's always made by the uh, Amtrak flackies, if I can use that term, is that they do have competition. They have competition um, by bus companies, by airlines, 
Uh, so there, there's different transportation services that are the competition, but not railway competition. I mean, we, we remember reading no, in history no. the cutthroat entrepreneurs of the 1890s and all the different railway, railway companies and how they were laying tracks. And uh, now it's very difficult. There are really only two major companies that are private passenger railway companies. Uh, one is in Texas, the Texas Central, and then Brightline Trains that I mentioned in Florida, and they're thinking about one in Vegas. Uh, but they come up against so many regulations, so many rules, so many requirements by different transportation departments in the various states. It, it's almost impossible. And again, there are a lot of people who are foamers and love trains and love to see them run. Me too. I think the more choice that we have, the more options that are available, that's all the better. But unfortunately, right now, it's just a subsidized system that isn't serving consumers. Yeah, competitions. When Alabama plays multi-directional state in a tune-up, it's technically a competition on the field, but we know how it's going to go on. Amtrak is not in competition with the airlines. That's just a silly, like, by any measurable metric, uh, that is not a competition. That's a hammer and a nail relationship, if you're going to call it a competition. Hey, precisely. And exactly, you know, we do have, you know, we had deregulation a bit of the airline industries uh, in the 18, 1980s and 90s. And then we did see new companies spring up. Uh, some went bankrupt. Others were able to be bought up. And then prices have reduced, you know, heavily. Um, you know, we're able to travel much cheaper. I think we can go even cheaper than that. That's the next step. Uh, but still, we saw where innovation, we're allowing consumers to find better options, where that actually has provided benefit. And I think it's something that does not just have to be true in one sector of the economy or one transportation you know, ideal, it can be with all of them. Well, one way that both of these have gotten into the news headlines lately is both airline regulation and Amtrak regulation made their way into President Biden's new executive order that he put out. Uh, this, is a, this is a really interesting executive order to me. There's 70 different items in this thing. Uh, you've been writing about it as well. Uh, I know you read it because I've read your piece on it. I read it. We put it up at ordinary-times.com. You can read the whole thing in PDF, which means you can search it. I know some folks like to cheat. I don't blame you. But all those made their way into this new, it was titled under Improving Competition. What did you make of this executive order? Because it's got 70 items. I don't want to bash the whole thing because I was kind of surprised. There's actually a couple couple line items in here that I liked, but on the whole, I found it to be a lot of the same old problems we have with these sorts of things. But what was your take on the Biden executive order on competition? I think there's a lot of it that was interesting, particularly in the language in the beginning. It talked about reducing barriers to entry for market competitors. It's kind of you know e economics talk, uh, but it means allowing new companies to exist and getting rid of red tape or regulation that might get in the way. And then talking about ways that there are regulations that restrict competition and choice. Um, they are talking about price transparency at hospitals, easing occupational licensing, things like open banking. But then on the flip side, we have even more harmful subsidies that raise prices. There are things like more bailouts for the farmers, more bailouts for the airlines, even more money for Amtrak. And that's the kind of stuff that I think is actually going to harm consumers. And another thing that's a big part of it, and I think probably takes most of the headlines, is the definition of antitrust and empowering agencies like the Federal Trade Commission to go after antitrust in a harder way, uh, to really seek out those big business elites who are making our lives terrible. Um, I don't know how you fall on that, but for me, I don't see social media companies as large monopolies that are taking away all of our rights and liberties and restricting choice. Because I have all types of open systems on social media. I use things like RSS feeds. I use things that I build myself. I use things like Facebook or Instagram or Twitter if I want to. But there are all kinds of different products out there. It just so happens that the big ones are the popular ones. And what this kind of order lays out is that the federal government will have a role in breaking up mergers and acquisitions of these companies, of trying to split them up if they've gotten too big. And I think that's just the wrong focus. You need to look at where regulations are propping up the bad companies that are just receiving subsidies and not providing value and the bad regulations that are really coming out at our expense and may make things more expensive. Where I fall on it is pretty simple. I And I've thought about this a lot the last couple of years doing public commenting and writing is the Internet as we know it right now, is the greatest tool for expressing freedom and free ideas that the human race has ever devised. 
And anybody that wants to lessen the freedom to do that online is really going to have to sell me on the reason they want to do so. Because history tells us something like the Internet, which is an innovation of, you know, a millennial type innovation in the way it's changed humanity. You you aren't going to make it any more free going forward. It's probably as free and open as it's ever going to get right now, and it's only going to get less so. And I think not that there shouldn't be some tweaking as we go to it, especially technology-wise, but you're going to have to really sell me on it because we see through history what happens when there's an innovation that sparks freedom. There's a whole lot of people that really want to get their hands on it. But that's where I fall on it since you asked. I think that makes sense. And, you know, many of us will all have enter the internet, you know, at a particular time. And, and for me, it was, you know, back in the days of CompuServe and Net Zero, if you guys remember that, I you know, remember the, that big, one. the big banner taking up half your screen, yep. you know, with the dial up. And I thought it was just amazing. You know, I was hosting websites about the cast of Saturday Night Live and, you know, my favorite sketches on GeoCities and connecting with people on things like Friendster. I mean, this was back in the day and it was just open and it was wonderful and it was great and now we have such a professionalization that i don't know the percentage but how many people would you predict now make their income solely based on stuff that happens on the internet i have to imagine oh, yeah. it's over 80 oh, percent yeah. and that's a, something that's just not taken in consideration everybody wants to beat up and split up facebook but every small business i know um you know in my hometown in north carolina they put out a lot of money on Facebook ads, and you know what? They work really well because <laughs> these yeah. algorithms are great. It's the same with Instagram, and we don't think about that. Is these companies are not just you know a social network; they're much more than that, and they provide value much beyond you know your kindergarten classmate. It's also in connecting people to small businesses. It's not just you know Kleenex that's finding all these customers. It's the local bar. It's the local pet shop. And that's another thing that just the ancillary effects and positive benefits are never analyzed because everything has to be viewed in this kind of black versus white, one way versus another way, and there's absolutely no nuance. And I think that's what's so problematic about a lot of this. Well, now that I gave you my battle of the line, defend the internet at all cost speech, let me do back off for just a second about this executive order, because I think some of the doomsaying on this particular uh, document, it's 33 pages. I've read all of it. There's some language in here that I've, I found really, really interesting. Uh, encouraged is used 14 times. Work with, work across, work to, that phrasing, that's 34 times. Develops eight times. Consider considerations 24 times. In fact, the word order only actually appears once in this entire executive order, which is a little odd. It seems to me that they're kind of maybe lawyery language assaging some of this stuff to make it look like they're going to push it quietly and probably try to avoid some of the court battles and legislative battles about all this stuff. So it seems like even though it's an executive order and they're putting all this stuff out there, they kind of maybe are subtly telling us, hey, we really can't just shove this through with an executive order. We're going to have to do some legislative and other things, and we're going to use this language to try to avoid a court battle over it. And I've even heard you mention that on a previous program, that so much of what is happening at the Supreme Court is they're putting back in their replies and their responses, this is for the legislature to figure out, not us. And in this order, what I kind of see is you know, there are always critiques of executive orders, uh, particularly when there are a lot of them and there's a flurry on day one. Um, I think overall executive orders are necessary because it's the executive office and you kind of have to communicate somehow. It's not just doing press conferences and going out and, and doing TV. You have to put out some official documents so that agencies know what to do. And I think that is all fine and good. This is just kind of the agenda um, that we see. You know, it's empowering the FTC to do X or Y, um, you know, allow the Department of Agriculture to help out the farmers who want to be able to fix their parts and, and all of this. And I, I don't see that as a bad thing. I, I do think that the arcs that are developed within the executive order, things like uh, all the subsidies that I mentioned, you know, at the same time saying that subsidies are bad for things like fossil fuels, uh, we're still going to keep them up for airlines and Amtrak and, and all these others. Uh, I will, let's do a positive note here. There was a note about the alcohol market. I know I'm going back to this, um, but <laughs> the executive order lays out that there are unnecessary trade practice regulations that artificially raise the price of beers, wines, and spirits. Uh, I would posit that 
actually the biggest uh, barrier are state monopolies, uneven taxation between the classes of alcohol. I think that's probably two areas of regulation that are fairly easy to fix. I know people are doing that across the country, uh, particularly in the South. That, that's definitely been something detrimental. So that was positive language. Um, I think whatever was, was mentioned, though, is not uh, the correct answer, though. Yeah, and uh, I you mentioned on one that I actually really was, I was kind of surprised to see it, frankly, but I'm heartened because a lot of people haven't talked about it. Uh, there, there's a thing out there called right to repair when it comes to the agricultural industry, and you, you briefly mentioned it, but for folks that don't know what that is, is uh, farmers, especially in the agriculture industry, are having a real fight right now over their equipment. Uh, you have a company, I'm not picking on them, they're just the big dogs, so you've got to use them, so this isn't a knock on them, but companies like a John Deere, who, because there's so much technology in the farm equipment, like tractors and harvesters and things like this, I, 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 some folks may not realize that your average tractor now has terrain mapping and GPS units in it, <laughs> you know, people don't think of it that way, but they have all this technology going into equipment now, and they're using things like software licensing and things like that to say, well, you can't repair anything on this piece of equipment at all, it has to come to us. And that becomes an enormous burden and strain, not just financially, but you, you, you know, your equipment goes down because you got to ship it off to wherever. Uh, that was one thing in there I was really surprised at, and that really kind of fits into the consumer choice stuff we're talking about. Is like a farmer should be able to fix his own tractor without having to be feared of being sued by the manufacturer, right? Yeah, the the right to repair movement I think is interesting. Um, I haven't really taken a, a solid line because I think it really depends industry versus industry. Yeah, it's complicated. And if we, yeah, if we mandate that every product that's ever made, you know, should have ready and easy parts that third parties can build as well, that makes it very expensive for entrepreneurs. It might make products more expensive, but at the same time, there are larger companies that do restrict, you know, the uh, replacement parts that you're able to put in there. Um, and just to bring up a point of culture saw a great YouTube video about the uh, McDonald's ice cream machines. And this is a, a similar... You're trolling me now because you know how much I tweet about the McDonald's ice cream machine. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I, I know you've read about that, but the, the idea that you have this one ice cream company, you know, that essentially has the monopoly within the McDonald's to provide ice cream, and in the contract states that only a technician from this company can fix it. Oftentimes he just enters a code and everything is fine. But it's, it's this kind of thing to where... That's within the purview of McDonald's. You know, should there be a law that uh, we need to have our own third-party ice cream machine repairmen? That's probably not the answer. It'd be a better answer for McDonald's perhaps to have other ones or people just to go to Dairy Queen if they want their ice cream or people just to go to other shops and stores. Uh, there's a lot of interesting dynamics. And that's another thing I've noticed from being in this consumer choice field is that there are tons of lobbyists that push various rules and regulations. Everyone assumes that they're all big, bad, big business, uh, you know, former Republicans, but oftentimes many people are former Democrats who are in the Biden administration or in the Obama administration, they were in the Clinton administration, they have the relationships up in DC and craft the rules to favor particular industries. And that's the big kind of difference that we also have is calling out that cronyism you know, there are so many circumstances where laws are written that favor X or Y company, X or Y industry, and that's detrimental to you because you don't have as much choice. Your prices are artificially inflated by this quasi strange monopoly that's enforced by regulation. It's not just the big bad business, it's also the aid of governmental regulations that stop that. And I hope by putting light on that, shining on it, talking about it, discussing it, providing alternatives that are smarter, that are more streamlined, we can hopefully improve things and provide some kind of better consumer choice. I wonder to, let me get your perspective on this, because we know, we understand that the internet and social media and the technology age we live in is changing everything. We talked about how, uh, you know, the trains, train technology is 100 plus years old now. The airline industry rules are, are sometimes 50, 60 years old now. How much of a lot of this is the fact that technology has outstripped and outran how we do regulation? For example, I don't think people realize that, you know, the way CPE is calculated for an airline, you know, cost per embarked passenger, you know, that doesn't, that hasn't really changed the formula, even though now almost all airline tickets are purchased online. You have the train system we talked about before where it's, it hasn't really changed in 100 years. 
I, I wonder how much of this is folks can see all that fine print on stuff now, and now they can just pull out their phone and go, well, what do you mean I'm getting charged for a landing fee and a gate fee? What, what, what is all this stuff on my airline ticket? I think there's some of that going on here, too, and that's creating a lot of the conflict. But in that conflict, there should be an opportunity for people to go, well, wait a minute, we need to reexamine how this stuff is because the technology is changing, yeah? Yeah, and there are regulations that make sense at a particular time in a particular context. And that's the problem with legislation is that it is permanent. Unless it's changed or amended, signed away, struck down, it's there and it's the rules of the road. And oftentimes the political context changes, our market context changes. If we were to shape all of our antitrust laws around, you know, the concerns of of Ma Bell or Microsoft, you know, would we even be able to understand how to regulate things like Facebook or Twitter in the 21st century? Probably not. And that's why another argument that for smarter regulation is they need to be as general as possible. Because the more complex and complicated, it's no mistake that the big four accounting firms, uh, things like Deloitte and PwC, that these companies make billions of dollars a year. Their expertise is in regulatory compliance. They help your company get through all the loopholes so that you can sell your product or offer your service. And we've made it so complicated that, yeah, it's due to change every single decade. You know, they didn't see things like Uber coming. They didn't see things like Airbnb coming. They surely did not see things like the legalization of cannabis coming or things like vaping products. So what, how are we supposed to apply that regulation? And that's where we do need a lot more innovation not just in terms of products, but how we view the rules on those products. And the more complicated they are, as we know from economics and public choice, essentially all these new market entrants are locked out. So the only people who can comply are those with the lawyers, those with the money, and those with the time to make it happen. And the guy who's tinkering in his garage, you know, the Steve Jobs and the Steve Wozniak of yesteryear, these guys won't exist unless they have a trust fund and a whole horde of lawyers behind them. Yeah. And to your point, there's a big push coming out of the EU now. You live in Europe, so you, you read the media over there. There's a big push out of the EU and also in some quarters in the United States about globalizing taxes and regulation. Some folks are pushing that as a climate change thing with carbon taxes, but then there's another call for in the age of the Amazons and the Alibabas of the world that there should be a globalized taxing of those kind of global companies. It sure seems like when we're talking about, hey, regulation needs to be generalized, there's a lot of folks that want to not only make it very specific, but want to try to make it one size fit all for not just countries now or regional powers like the EU and America, but they want to try to push it to be a global thing. That just doesn't seem like it's going to be a, a recipe for freedom at all. And, and it's interesting because it you know puts our uh, very Amero-centric view of federalism on court uh, because we always view the states as the laboratories of democracy, right? That's right. our big idea in the United States. And if we apply that globally, which we have done and you know throughout globalization in the last fifty or sixty years, it's been a net benefit you know for for the world. Free trade has been amazing. It's not you couldn't say that the past four years, but free trade is amazing and has provided us all kinds of great things. And now we have these countries that have offered better regulatory circumstances or situations. You know, Ireland was this backwater slum forever. And then by offering a low tax environment and a a pretty keen regulatory structure, they were able to invite most of the larger tech companies to go set up base there in Ireland, Uh, in the Netherlands, much the same. And with that, they have this huge advantage. You know, I don't mean to toot the horn of one of my favorite European countries, Estonia, but here's a country of one million people. um, And they have basically four or five unicorn companies, you know, $1 billion companies that are coming out of that nation of a million people. And that is just fascinating to think because they've offered a system with very low taxes, with very easy bureaucracy. Uh, Everything is kind of all digital. Everyone has ID cards. They have an e-residency program that's really fascinating and I would recommend to people who are listening. And if we go towards this global harmonization, we lose all of that. And essentially, it means that there's less of an incentive to participate in free trade and less of an incentive to talk to our neighbors and trade with them. And I view that as as very problematic. I know it's very utopian in vision, 
and there's a that's kind of a big problem of politics is everyone's competing visions of utopia. Uh, but this one particularly, we might think it's just about the fat cats and wealth taxes and all of this, but it's really going to impact much more than that. Yeah, and to round this back to where we started with consumer choice, what are you seeing uh, kind of on the on the normal folk level? Because I think what I've seen a lot just observing and, and anecdotally, I think the pandemic, folks have really started to take stock on how they consume things. We're seeing it in the reaction to schools, both positive and negative, because, hey, all of a sudden people are really focusing on schools because there was no school for a year. People are focusing on how they consume things because they a lot of them couldn't go to the store for a year. Things like the alcohol thing you're talking about, where I live you know, in the South, I have a home, they have the ABC system. I, I think one of the things coming out of this pandemic now is I think folks may have a more focused and change of attitude in how they view consumer choice because for most of them in their first time probably in their adult lives, unless they lived through the maybe World War II rationing in America, they were not given the option to just go do basic level consumerism as they've always done in their life. How do you think the reaction as we come out of the pandemic now going forward, do you think that's going to change how people approach these types of issues? Yeah, I think it, it hit home for a lot of people, particularly those who, you know, were all of a sudden confined to their, their homes. And, you know, it's not everybody. There are still a lot of people who are working 40 hours a week out in the open. But, I, you know, we had this criticism very early on when we started focusing on these topics it's like, why does anyone care about sugar taxes? Nobody cares about taxes on alcohol. Nobody cares about this and that. Why are you complaining about this? We've got bigger, you know, more existential issues, things like climate change, and you're just going on about, you know, various taxes on products. Well, it's like, well, that's actually what people can see. You know, if they have less money at the grocery store because of some trade war deal that's made their chicken or steak more expensive, that takes away from their disposable income at the end of the week. It impacts them. It affects them. And so many of these things around us, whether it be with transportation or in the products that we consume, our healthcare services, where we see things that have just been strangled by regulation and rules for so long. And there are all these creative entrepreneurs who are trying to deliver these alternative products, and they're not able to do so. People are going to recognize that a lot more. I think they already have. I think uh, particularly working online, realizing that people can do so much more stuff on the internet. It doesn't make people afraid of the internet or think that we need to break everything up. It makes them more reliant, but also more encouraged by what you can do that you can order. You can order all of your groceries to your home without leaving. I mean, that's that right there is life changing. I try to explain this to my grandmother uh, who's in rural Quebec and yeah, she's uh, flabbergasted by this. So it's, it's these kind of things that, we have to think about ordinary people. Not everybody is a political warrior. Not everybody is rooting for a team. Most people are just getting by. They're trying to hang out with their family. They're trying to have a good barbecue on the weekend. And highlighting the rules that make that more difficult and more expensive, I think, is to their favor. I think more people would want to have consumer choice at the end of the day. We're not all invested in the big political fight, but we all try to live our lives the best we can for ourselves and our families. And I think that's been the best avenue for us to approach these issues and really try to speak to the average person rather than, you know, the typical political warrior in New York, D.C. or elsewhere. Yeah, I would cite it if I could remember who said it first. But uh, the folks that are talking about Congress and the Section 230 stuff is like they don't I don't think Congress realizes that Facebook is way more popular than they are, even with all the issues. I don't remember who said it first, but I think that's a good reminder for for the maybe our political class to understand like, hey, everybody likes these sorts of things a lot more than they like what they think you might be trying to do them at the end of the day. Yeah, indeed. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is who gets involved in the political process anyway. You know, I think seeing the Tea Party, seeing a lot of the uh, CRT backlash, whatever people might think of that, you're getting ordinary people involved in the political process. And they're understanding that they're fairly new to it. It's very cumbersome. It's hard to understand. And there aren't many people who go there trying to really change things for the general masses. That doesn't happen often. And usually I would say those people who are so altruistic probably have bad economic ideas or you know their own bad incentives. But that's why it's important to look at the issues that you care about, things that are impacted by different regulations and rules, and figure out what you can do. I mean, you mentioned this a lot on, on your program, and I've heard you on other interviews. 
you know, the big federal bills and all these big things in D.C. can have an impact on your life, sure. But your city council, your school board, uh, the people who live down the street from you, they're impacting your life today. And whether it be in the number of zoning permits that are offered in your town or your county, uh, I mean, that's a big deal. And it can mean a lot for you. It can mean a lot for your home. It can mean a lot for purchasing a new home. And I think focusing more on that and less on the ideological battles, let's not let Twitter you know, determine what the political fault line is. Let's figure out the fault line that is the regulations, the government, those with the power versus ordinary people. And the more we recognize that, the more that people kind of put down their battle rifles of ideology, I think we'll be a lot better off. Yeah, I hope so. And I, I know people are kind of recoiling a little bit because they see these unruly school board meetings and things like that. And I think people should behave themselves in public and keep their bearing. You know, I don't denounce some of the silliness that comes into those things, but freedom's a messy thing. Freedom's uncomfortable. Freedom means you're going to have to, you know, a representative democracy like America has means you're going to have to hear opinions you don't like and you're going to have to win in the arena ideas sometimes. And I, I hope we, we learn to understand that we need to live with a little bit of a mess because that's the national, natural machinations of our country working, and those are good things. Yael Ososki, you're brilliant. Tell folks where they can find your stuff and what you have going on. I know you got a lot of writing projects. You've got consumer choice going on, but run down a few of the places folks can find you and what you and your team's been doing. Well, I'm on the big bad social medias, uh, at Yael O-S-S. The evil, the big <laughs> evil very, Tech. very evil. Yeah, yeah. You, you could find uh, most of my stuff there. Um, sort of my personal website where I put all of the articles that I write, um, some in French, in English, uh, some publications in the U.S., some in Europe, uh, just yael.ca. So I own my own domain uh, because I love the internet and I love the, uh, you know, owning my own domain. <laughs> and uh, just look up consumerchoicecenter.org. A lot of my great colleagues uh, doing work around, around the world. So uh, not just here in the U.S., but uh, also in Europe. South America, uh, different parts of Asia. It's, uh, it's fun. It's fun to be able to talk about this stuff and do it and, and actually kind of build a career out of it. So it's been, it's been a blast so far. Yeah, man. Who's got it better than us? We get to basically talk and write for a living. That's not too bad a gig, is it? Very true. I, that's why I feel bad for those who have to listen. But I think uh, this time, hopefully, that the product was uh, well worth it for their ears. Yeah, we are we are blessed and thankful, and uh, I, I know I can speak with you. We don't ever take it for granted that we, we've got a pretty good thing going, but uh, thank you for your time, my friend. I look forward, we'll definitely be doing this again, and I look forward to getting you back. All right, all the best. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. You know, something that came up talking with Yael was when we had things like the lockdown and COVID restrictions for the first time in most people's lives, they were restricted artificially from doing their normal consumerism that they usually do, like going to the store, going to schools, going. Many people couldn't go to their regular jobs in some cases. Maybe that was the first time that they stopped and thought about how something like consumer choice really affects our lives. And maybe that'll be a good catalyst for us to start reviewing things like regulations and rules and laws. When you go without something for the first time, it tends to either get a reaction where you just buck against it, or you can do a little reflection and wonder why it was like that in the first place. I don't know which way we'll go as a country going forward from the pandemic, but I do hope that folks will not take for granted things like going to the store whenever you want to, or going to school on a regular schedule, or going to your job, or your job going remote at the last minute, or even the fact that certain people in our economy are much more flexible than others, and we don't necessarily think about it when you can close down and protect one segment of society and then ordain that another segment of society has to keep working. Letting consumers have choice is really going to be the only way they have pushback on a lot of these things other than going through their elected representatives. Because we don't make laws in America, our elected representatives do. But we can vote with our feet and we can vote with our wallet. And it's important to make sure our freedom to do those two things stays in place just as much as our freedom at the ballot box is to pick our elected officials. We don't get a whole lot of say in the wider world and the events that are going on. But in those two areas, voting and our consumer choices, we do. And those are areas we need to pay very careful attention to and make sure those two freedoms are maintained. Because if we don't maintain them, the next generation won't have them. And then a lot of the things that we're talking about won't matter because you won't be able to do anything at all about it. 
that's it for this edition of Herd Tell. Thank you so much for all the support. Uh, we feel like we're really starting to get a stride with these programs. Uh, we have some exciting guests lined up. The partnership with Young Voices is really bearing fruit. We're going to be starting out with the video form of this podcast coming soon in the next few weeks. You can be looking for that. Go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already because that's going to have all kinds of great stuff from Herd Tell going forward. And wherever you are listening to this podcast, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Google, whatever service you're using, please make sure you leave a rating and a comment. Uh, We were reading through the iTunes comments the other day. We even posted some of them on social media. Thank you so much for that. That's important because giving those ratings and reviews lets other people know that they can check out our program and we're going to not waste their time. We're going to respect their time by giving them something really good and hopefully thought-provoking to listen to. There's a lot of podcasts out there. There's more being added every day. And if you take the time for us, we want to respect that time by giving you the very best we can. We thank you as always for listening. We appreciate you telling others about Herd Tell. Wherever you and yours are around the world, we hope we, this finds you very, very well. Until we talk again next time, y'all take care. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.